Well, hey, hey, what is up, Mission? Hey, uh, apparently I need to leave more often because no one's ever this excited to see me. That's great. Um, but hey, my name is Taylor Hunt, and I get to work with our middle school and high school students here at Mission, um, if we've never met before. And my family and I were on a break this summer. We were on sabbatical, getting some extended vacation, some time to rest, and we were excited to be back. But man, I just wanted to uh, also say thank you. You know, it was so good to get to make some memories together as a family. Uh, you know, over the summer, our oldest daughter turned three, and our youngest daughter turned one. Um, so man, fun getting to celebrate their birthdays. We actually went to Disneyland like the week before their birthdays uh, because they were still free at that time. So we had to work the system that way. Uh, over the summer, our one-year-old started walking. And so now she's going to be walking around the lobby here at Mission and probably making a beeline to go outside out the roll-up doors. So I'm going to have to watch her like a hawk. Uh, this summer also, my wife and I got to get away, just the two of us, for an entire week. Man, let me tell you, it was so nice to be away. And guys, you should have seen us. We decided that we were going to be kid-free for a week. So we were going to live it up like a couple of wild and crazy senior citizens. And that <laughs> is exactly what we did. We hit that 4.30 dinner special in bed by 8.30, and it was awesome. Uh, but man, there were just so many times over this summer where we would look at each other and just be like, man, I cannot believe that we get to do this. Like, I cannot believe that a couple of knuckleheads like us get to work at such an amazing and incredible place like Mission, where they care about us more than just what we do. And, you know, students had the best summer that it's ever had without me. Um, and so I think I should leave more, all right? I think that was the solution. But, man, so many people stepped in and helped out. And so, man, we just want to say thank you. We really are so grateful uh, to get to be a part of this place and to get to be a part of this church. And if you're new uh, here at Mission, maybe just started coming over the summer, um, you might be looking at me right now and be like, all right, this guy said he was gone, but I'm pretty sure he was here over the summer and even taught one weekend. Um, but you are actually thinking of Jake Barker, who is the lead pastor at Real Life Church, who was here and taught for a week. And there is literally little to no resemblance between the two of us. So... I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, but this week we are continuing in a series that we started last week called Promises. And man, if you missed last week, we kicked it off by talking about how we have a God who promises that he is dependable even when it feels like everything is crumbling. And we got to interview one of our good friends, Lindsay. Um, and man, if you missed it, make sure you go check it out because it was just an awesome, awesome interview. And then next week, Jody Hickerson is going to be back. Woo! It's going to be awesome. And talking about how nothing can separate us and that promise that God gives us. And this week, we're going to be talking about the promise that God gives us rest. And you know, after being away on some extended vacation, you might be like, well, this guy, he's probably a pro at rest. Um, but let me tell you, our summer was busy. Like, we did a bunch of trips. We went to the most magical place on earth, Palm Springs. <laughs> which boasts that it has more pools than people because you got to be by a pool in that 118 degree heat. Uh, we went to visit family in Oklahoma, in Florida, did the Disneyland thing. But also all summer long, we had the incredible gift of getting sick <laughs> multiple times. You know, uh, my wife and I both had the flu for a couple of days. After we left Disneyland, Daly left with the best souvenir of all, pink eye. Um, and then because I'm just so competitive, I decided to get pink eye in both of my eyes. So that's what I did. And then the next day we got on a plane uh, to fly to Oklahoma. So I had my Dodger hat on low, had my Ray-Bans on, just trying to, you know, stay away from everybody and hide my red cyborg eyes. And one of my friends was like, you probably look like a D-list celebrity flying on Southwest. I was like, thank you. Um, I don't know. Uh, then we went and hung out with my in-laws, and my mother-in-law got sick. My father-in-law got sick. My brother-in-law's girlfriend got sick. And then my daughter, um, one day after eating dinner, decided uh, to just return all of the food that she had previously eaten all over me. Um, and that was great. And you might hear that and be like, oh my goodness, I feel so bad. We had a great summer. Don't feel bad. And it also just kind of feels par for the course, because honestly, I get sick all the dang time. Like, 
I still get ear infections in motion sick like I am a five-year-old kid. Uh, whenever I was growing up, I got chicken pox. Whenever I got into the eighth grade, I got mono, which anybody know the nickname for mono? Anybody know the nickname? It's the kissing disease. And take a look at eighth grade Taylor. Let me tell you, this guy was definitely getting the kissing. Di no, not at all. I don't know how I got it. Uh, but mono and chicken pox are these two sicknesses, these illnesses that once you got it, like you got it. You carry it around in your body for the rest of your life. And you know, I've been realizing the past couple of years that there's this other little sickness, this little illness, this thing that I think I've caught and I've carried around for a while. And it's this little thing called hurry sickness. Any of you guys ever heard of this before? Any of you think you've got this? And you know, I'm not sure if you've ever used uh, WebMD before, but if you haven't, there is no better way to convince yourself that you have a terminal illness. <laughs> Uh, but on WebMD, there is a symptom checker where you can type your symptoms in, answer a few yes or no questions, and then it will spit out a diagnosis right then and there for you. And so I thought that today we might kind of do like a hurry sickness symptom checker. So see if any of these things would get checked off or answered yes or no for you. Do you ever find yourself rushing around even when you don't have to? Do you find yourself multitasking more or less? Have you ever found yourself cooking dinner while finishing up a work call, doing your makeup at the stoplight, or checking email while you're playing at the park with your kids? Are you constantly late for meetings, social events, soccer practice, or church? Have you gotten any speeding tickets lately? When the stoplight turns yellow, do you hit the brakes or hit the gas? When you're at the grocery store, do you count the number of the people in each of the checkout lines and go to the one that you think has the least amount of people? And then are you kind of mad whenever the guy that you thought was at the back of the longest line actually gets done checking out before you and you're like, oh, I hate that guy. Uh, when you have a day off, do you find yourself getting more anxious, agitated, irritable, and you're not really sure why? Have you missed big events, birthdays, dinner parties, date nights, soccer games, just because you were just too busy? When you're around family or friends, do you find yourself being present but unengaged? Like, sure, you're there and you show up in the photos, but, but you weren't really there. Does your mind race at night when you lay down to sleep? Do you find yourself feeling more and more numb? Have you lost your sense of gratitude, wonder, and awe? If you answered yes to one or more of these questions, you may suffer from hurry sickness. I mean, when someone asks us how we're doing, what do most of us say? Fine. Busy. Maybe we say fine. How was your summer? Busy. How are the kids? Busy. How's work? Busy. How was that vacation? Busy. How was the honeymoon? Well, we got busy. No, no, no. Okay, I don't want to know that, all right? I mean, most of us, we live at this breakneck pace. Like, we go from the job site to soccer practice to hair appointments to the salon to back to school nights and work calls and PTA meetings in tennis camps and football practice. Like, most of us listen to our podcasts on two times speed because who has time to listen at normal speed? I mean, maybe people would describe us as a grinder. And, you know, we're always working 50-plus hours, two to three jobs because, like, that's just all we know. You know, maybe we grew up in a family, our upbringing, part of our culture was just that you hustled and you grinded and you did whatever you had to do to just stay busy. You know, funny enough, in 1967, a Senate subcommittee jointly predicted that by the year 1985, the average American would only be working, get this, 27 hours a week for 22 weeks a year because of all the advances in technology that were going to free us up and let us spend more time in leisure activities. But the reality is that leisure time is actually in decline in America. You know, a whopping 37% of us take fewer than seven vacation days per year. You know, long gone is the 40-hour work week. One psychologist shows that the average American has worked more with each passing decade since the 60s today, so that now the average full-time job has a full month added onto it. 
See, technology has not multiplied our leisure. It's multiplied our labor. And we just can't get rest. You know, the number of Americans who take sleeping pills has doubled since 2010. And most experts believe that stress and hurry are the blame. See, we are overworked, disconnected, underrested. And for you Rolling Stones fans, like we just can't get no satisfaction. You know, one of my uh, favorite pastors, like my pastoral man crush, is this guy named John Mark Comer. And he wrote this incredible book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, which this teaching has largely uh, been shaped by. But in it, he writes this. He says that hurry is violence on the soul. Like hurry does damage to us. Hurry does damage to our marriage. Hurry does damage to our kids. Hurry does damage to our lives. It does violence to our relationships. It destroys some things inside of us. Michael Dye, who has worked with people in recovery for over 20 years, says that two of the first steps that lead to a relapse are forgetting priorities and speeding up. Because for all of us, the breakneck pace that we live at just does violence to our lives. Author Ronald Roheiser says, we, for every kind of reason, good and bad, are distracting ourselves into spiritual oblivion. We are more busy than bad, more distracted than non-spiritual. And that line haunts me. We are distracting ourselves into spiritual oblivion. You know, a couple months ago, I read this great little book that had one of the best titles that I've ever heard. And it was called, Amusing Ourselves to Death. And I'd tell you more about what that book was about, but honestly, I was just too busy and in a hurry to finish it. Um, So I didn't get past the title. You know, Corey Ten Boom once said that if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. And there is so much truth in that. Because sin and busyness both cut us off from our awareness of God and the people that he's put around us. And if I can just be honest with you, Like, this is something that I really struggle with. You know, I talk fast. I walk fast. Sometimes I think so fast that my mouth can't keep up. You know, I listen to my podcasts on 1.5 speed. Uh, I love to pack my schedule. In the past couple years, I have gotten um, two different tickets on two different occasions, one of which I blew right through a red light because I was hurried and worried and stressed. And that is also why I will never put a mission sticker on the back of my truck, all right? I'm just saying. (laughs) I mean, even this week, as I was getting ready for this talk, I was feeling a little bit behind, a little bit hurried. And so I was going for a walk whenever I thought, I'll pull out uh, my phone and I'll read a book on my phone that's about hurry sickness. And so I was walking and reading a book on my phone about hurry sickness when I walked into a tree. (laughs) And I just felt like God was like, dude, what are you doing? See, I've seen in my life, That all of my worst moments, as a dad, as a husband, as a friend, as a son, as a follower of Jesus, all of my worst moments come when I am in a hurry. And most of us, if we're honest, we are tired, we are weary, We are restless, numb, half present to the people and places around us and too distracted and too busy to actually live a full life. And that's why I love the promise that we're looking at today. This promise that Jesus gave almost 2,000 years ago that was just as true for those people then as it is for us today. See, to a crowd of tired, weary farmers and fishermen, to men and women who felt tired from all the burdens of life, People who felt tired because of the economy, to these fishermen who were just trying to make ends meet, to these farmers who were trying to put food on the table, to people who were tired because of their family, who were tired because of their health. Like back in the first century, a paper cut or the common cold could be lethal because they didn't have advanced medical technology. See, back in the first century, people were tired because of the political climate that they were facing, which none of us can relate to today. Like to this group of tired, weary, burdened, worn out people. People who are living a life of hurry sickness. 
Jesus gives this promise. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden that I give you is light. See, this promise, it is good news. This promise, it is like medicine for our hurry, sick souls. It's like a prescription. It's the doctor's note. And so I thought today we'd kind of walk through this promise step by step to get this medicine into our hearts and our minds. See, Jesus starts by saying, just come to me. Like, come to me. All of you who are weary, come to me. Bring those burdens to me. Bring those things that you're carrying to me. Like, where do you go when you're tired? Where do you go when you're looking for real rest? You know, a couple of years ago, um, my dad, who has worked in the airline industry for over 30 years, um, had worked mainly at the same company in those 30 years. But in 2021, like so many other people, he got let go, um, laid off, just all of a sudden, out of the blue, after working at the same place for 30 years. You know, a couple weeks later, um, my mom's mom, so my grandma, moved in with my parents. And so now they were entering that season where they're parenting their parents, which is just such a hard season to be in. And my dad was feeling tired. He was feeling weary. He was feeling burdened. And so for some reason, he decided to start running. Um, and so he started running almost every single day. Like he turned into a regular old Forrest Gump, you know, like if he was going somewhere, he was running. <laughs> but whenever he would run, he would ask himself these two questions. He would just say, what am I running to? And what am I running from? And I love those questions. Because all too often, our hurry is a sign of something else, of something deeper. Usually that we're running away from something. Father wounds, childhood trauma, last names, deep insecurity, deficits of our self-worth, fear of failure, fear of not being enough, having enough, running from our sin, running from our shame. Maybe we're running away from this boring middle section of life, running from a midlife crisis. And sometimes we're running to something. You know, we run to the couch, we run to the bottle, we run to the next high, we run to a Netflix binge, maybe we run to a motorcycle, like that'll help this whole midlife crisis thing. You know, some of us, we run to the refrigerator, we run to our phones, we run to the mall, we run to the office, we run to promotions, we run to the gym, we run to a new relationship, searching for something that no earthly experience has to offer. Real, true rest. You know, in the Old Testament, there was this king named Solomon who he ran after anything and everything looking for rest. And he writes this. He says, so what do people get in this life for all their hard work and anxiety? Their days of labor are filled with pain and grief. And even at night, their minds cannot rest. It is all meaningless. He would go on to say, Then I observe that most people are motivated to success because they envy their neighbors, but this too is meaningless. It's like, it's kind of like chasing after the wind. He says, Success, money, mansions, beachfront houses, the latest pad of Gucci, wine, women, sex, fame, trying to keep up with the Kardashians, all of these things that we run to, they are all just meaningless. You know, a couple of years ago, I learned that Hawaiians have a slang term that they use for mainlanders, and they call us um, haole. They started calling mainlanders haole uh, from the moment they first set foot in Hawaii in the 1800s because they noticed that these mainlander people were running around from thing to thing, and the word haole means no breath. And so they noticed that they were in such a hurry that they were out of breath. And so often I have been chasing after real rest in all the wrong places, and it has left me more tired because it's like chasing the wind. And yet Jesus says, just come to me. Come to me. What are you running from? Whatever it is, just bring it to me. Are you running from grief? Bring that to me. 
Are you running from worry? Are you running from a past hurt? Like, just bring that to me. Bring your doubts to me. Bring your failures to me. Bring your burdens to me. Bring it all to me. And don't run somewhere else. Don't run to the bottle. Don't run to the binge. Don't run to the office. Just run to me. Come to me. All of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, bring those things to me. Bring that mess to me. And I will give you rest. Did you know that the thing that separates the good athletes from the great athletes, like the things that separates the pros from like the Olympians and the Hall of Famers, it's not uh, natural skill, it isn't how hard they train, it isn't even coaching. Like the thing that separates the good from the greats is how much they rest. See, rest is hard work. And rest takes intentionality in our hurry, sick world. And I've noticed in my life that when I slow down, when I try to rest, whenever I'm like, okay, Jesus, I'll just come to you, usually it feels like things get worse, not better. Have you ever been driving along when all of a sudden your car begins to make like a banging or a bashing sound, you know, like a clicking or a light comes on, you know, something happens underneath the hood and you were like, oh no, that does not sound good. And then honestly, how many of us, you know, sometimes you're like, I do not have the money or the time or the attention right now to work on that. Like, I'm just so busy. And so what do you do? You just kind of lean forward. You know, you turn the radio up or roll the windows down and just like pretend like it's not happening. I mean, sometimes that's what it feels like when I slow down in my life, when I start to see what's really going on under the hood. I start to hear that anxiety that's been rattling in the background. You know, I feel bad about how I got mad and blew up on my wife the other week. Maybe I start to hear that guilt. I start to feel that exhaustion. I start to feel that shame. You know, I feel sad. I feel grief. Rest? That's the last thing I feel right now, Jesus. I mean, it felt better when I was going 100 miles an hour. And so what do we do? We just ramp right up and start speeding up again. Roll the windows down and just pretend like it's not happening. But the kind of rest that Jesus is talking about. Is so much more than just physical rest. When he says, I will give you rest, he means like soul rest, like deep rest. Rest from our striving, rest from our weariness, rest from our sin and our shame because of his death on the cross. Like he gives us rest from our hiding, rest from our guilt, rest from our burdens. And when we come to him in the midst of our hurry sickness, when we rest, That's when Jesus actually does some of his best work. And maybe one of the most famous songs in all of history, this song called Psalm 23, which was written by King David. And this is like a little platinum hit that has been read all throughout history. Check out what it says. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. And that term right there, quiet waters, in the original language, it actually translates to waters of rest. See, he leads us beside waters of rest. He restores my soul. Just like how sleep restores our bodies, there is a kind of soul rest that we all crave. And in Jesus' day, there was this day of the week called the Sabbath. And Sabbath was a big deal every single week. It was actually a day that was marked off by God after the Jews had been in slavery in Egypt for 400 years. And you know what slaves never get? A day off. Like they never get to rest. And in Egypt, God's people were seen as this sort of disposable battery, this disposable workforce. Just use them up till they die and then we don't rest and recharge them. We just replace them. And so when God rescued his people from captivity, he gave his people these 10 commandments to live by. They were like his top 10 ways to live like you aren't a slave anymore because you guys aren't slaves. And number four on the list was to keep the Sabbath, to take a day off, to rest, to delight, to worship the Lord your God who has saved you from captivity. And every week for thousands of years, God's people had this day of rest where he would restore their souls. See, it wasn't just this nice suggestion. It was a commandment. And Jesus came along saying like, I will give you rest, me. I will restore some things in you. When you read through the life of Jesus, his biographies in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll actually see that Jesus was healing people all the time. And most of the time when he healed somebody, It took place on the Sabbath. And Jesus was saying that my rest will give you true healing. 
And there might just be some things in us that Jesus wants to heal. There might be some things in us that he wants to restore. You know, maybe it's our marriage. Maybe it's our relationship with our kids. Maybe it's our health. Maybe it's our anger. Maybe it's that bitterness, that resentment. It's that binging. But Jesus just says, come to me and I will give you rest. In Psalm 62, it says, truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. He is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Just come to me and I will give you rest. See, the next part of this promise feels a little bit funny. Like if this promise really is medicine for our souls, if it is good news for our hurry sickness, then this next part could feel a little bit like the cough syrup. You know, this has that little aftertaste. Because next Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. Which a yoke was a work instrument for oxen back in Jesus' day. Like getting yoked back then meant something totally different than what it means today. And if we're honest, like a work instrument is what we think that tired, weary workers need the least. Like, Jesus, what are you doing? They need a mattress, a Mai Tai, a vacation, and a one-way ticket to Bali. Like, that's what tired people need. But I love that Jesus knows that the best gift he can give tired, weary, hurry-sick people is a new way to carry life. A way where we do life with him. See, he doesn't just offer us escape. He offers us equipment to live a new life of freedom. And when we put his yoke on us, when we live life his way, we will encounter real rest. But we also will lose some of our freedoms because he's in charge. You know, I love the way that Tim Keller says, we see that freedom is not what the culture tells us. Real freedom comes from a strategic loss of some freedoms in order to gain others. It is not the absence of constraints, but it is choosing the right constraints and the right freedoms to lose. Which sounds totally upside down and backwards to our American ears. Like, we like our freedom with a side of extra liberty. Like, we don't want no one telling us how to live or what to do. But Jesus says, put my yoke on you. Follow my teachings. Follow my way. Orient your whole life around me. Just come to me. Slow your life down. And then you will find rest for your souls. In Jeremiah 6, it says that this is what the Lord says. Stop at the crossroads and look around. Ask for the old godly way and, and walk in it. Travel its path and you will find rest for your souls. See, today there are a lot of paths. There are a lot of roads we can go down. There are a lot of people and products and influencers and officials who will promise us rest, who will promise us hope, who will promise us restoration. But look around. Where are those roads really leading? See, Jesus' promise is packed with this invitation to surrender. Real rest, real freedom is found when we let go and surrender to him. And not just like a once and done kind of thing. We're like, okay, God, that one time I brought my burdens to you, I surrendered and let the, let the resting and the freedom begin. Like, bring it on, God. What are you going to do? No, like every day, where every day we put his yoke on, where we hand him the reins, we say, God, you're in control. You lead me. I'll follow you. God, I want to do my life your way. You can have it all. And Jesus says that the invitation is pretty clear. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden that I give you is light. You know, I love how John Ortberg says that easy is a soul word, not a circumstance word. And Jesus never promised us an easy life. Jesus never promised us that trouble wouldn't hit. He never promised us that we wouldn't be weary and burdened and overwhelmed. He didn't promise us that we wouldn't have things to run from. He didn't promise us that life would be cancer-free. He didn't promise a life without loss. He didn't promise a life without infertility. He didn't promise a life without layoffs. He never promised an easy life. But he did promise an easy yoke. And he says, come to me. Are you tired? Are you weary? Are you burdened? Bring all that to me. Just come to me and I will give you rest. Let's pray together real quick. Um, God, we just thank you. 
God, we thank you that you are with us in the midst of our burdens. God, we thank you that you are with us in the midst of our hustle and our bustle and in the midst of our weariness. And God, I know some of us, we're here today, and God, we are exhausted. God, we feel like we've been running around um, everywhere. We've been looking for rest and restoration and healing in all the wrong places. And God, there are so many things that we've been running from and so many things that we've been running to. And God, we're so afraid that you would find out the mess that we've made of our lives. And so God, I pray that you would just remind us today that we can bring it all to you. God, that we can come, with you, come to you um, how we really are, not how we pretend to be. God, would you meet us in the midst of our weariness? Would you meet us in the midst of our tiredness? God, would you meet us and give us rest for our souls? And God, we're just so thankful for Jesus and how we can have real and eternal rest with you because of his sacrifice on the cross. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.